for a teacher to turn that into more of a And she um, accepted me into her classes. And I was so taken with her, her authority, her, her knowledge, her warmth, uh, and her sense of humor, all at the same time. Um, but I went the very next day uh, to make a uh, with whom I was dancing. I was dancing with my own dance company. It's uh, started to become a ballet dancer. Yeah. Um, and she said, well, she was very sweet. She said, um, if you really want to try and do classical work, you should try and do it while you're young, so go ahead. She was, there's no difficulty there, so that was wonderful. So I started studying with Miss Crass. And after a very short amount of time, this is the 50s. You, you think back to the 50s, those of you who can, most of you probably can't. <laughs> <laughs> but there weren't gurus around. I mean, there was not a master behind every bush as there is in this case. <laughs> and people didn't go to India. I mean, one didn't know anybody who did. And one thought of the East as really very, very far away. And during the summer, there was another guy in this, in this story who played a little part. He was also one of the dancers in Williamsburg, and he and Marie used to go and have these special conversations. I mean, I, nobody ever called them special conversations, but they seemed to me to be these special conversations. <laughs> and uh, um, I was aware of this and wondered about it. Um, he was still in the picture in the fall. Anyhow, one day, very shortly after I had um, started studying with Miss Christ, I called me one Saturday. I said, what's going on? And she said she was going to a little bookstore down in Britain, which was called Orientalia. So look for a book. Um, as I said about me, she's a very private person, very, very restrained, um, and shy. She remains so to this day. And, um, didn't, didn't tell me the name of the book. Yes, she did find the time. But it was a perfect master. So I still hadn't heard Bob's name. We went back in the book, so uh, you know. And so we looked in the shelves. I don't think she even asked the attendant to help her find this book. We got out under the sidewalk and I said, well, what is this? <laughs> she said, well, someday I'll tell you what it is. And I said, <laughs> How about today? <laughs> so we went to a street, we went to a coffee shop, and she told me about Bono. And I just went and went and went and went. I was completely unprepared for this. I had never heard anything about love, living for love. I mean, it was just completely foreign to anything uh, that I knew about. Um, it was really a terrific thought experience immediately. I mean, I guess that's the word. I don't know what it is. So, and um, she also said at that time that um, she wanted to really find out about this. You know, I've only known about Bob. She had heard about Bob from Texas. Also, through dancing, they'd been in a job together previously. So you have to go and, and speak with his friends about this. <laughs> That presented a whole other set of circumstances. <laughs> because although, as I say, there was great warmth and, and fun with Ms. Cross always, even in class, she was a very, very demanding teacher and an awesome figure in my life. Um, I was, uh, uh, as I say, completely involved in dancing. It was the only thing that I cared about or had anything to do with. And she was a teacher. I mean, I had to a certain extent, I think it's not, not incorrect to say I put myself in her hands. But after a couple of weeks, I did. Um, she had a dressing room, a place where she um, saw us. One wasn't unaccustomed to going there. If you were being particularly thick in class, but something, she'd say, come and see me after class. So you would go to her dressing room and she would help you. And you could also go there and ask her help too, if you were confused. So I knocked on the door and I asked her about my shoulder and I asked her about my hips. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, Mr. Cross, I want to find out about your ball. And when I said this, um, something happened to her. And the way I described it was as if a 
lot of lights went up. <laughs> and she said, and this is sort of um, a moment, she said, it's the most wonderful thing in the world, but it's also the most difficult thing in the world. And I said, that's perfectly all right with me. I'm prepared to give up everything except that thing. Which was one of the But I have formulated for myself. I mean, I was 18 by then. I had thought some about this, and I had this idea about nature. And I had to do that. And she, I don't know how many of you know her or know her well, but she is, I realize now, sizing me up. <laughs> she says, Oh, well, that, that seems to be fine. And that we would um, make a date and I would come and uh, visit with her at her room at the hotel. She did it for it. And then I was, we would talk about all of So I, I was very pleased with that and that. And the days went by, and I began to realize that we had no date. And we had talked about a date, but there was in fact a date. <clears throat> so I would start arriving early for class, and there when she arrived, she would say good morning, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd hang around after class, be there with my tongue hanging out as she left. She said, Bye. <laughs> Until finally, I know one day I. Give me a second, we're going to talk about it. to appear at the airport if you wanted to 
So this time we were allowed to go to Idlewild Airport. And although people were away, people, um, when I say people, other of the dancing people, uh, one of the other parts of this was that uh, we didn't have meetings, I guess I said that. We went one by one to talk with these friends. And um, we didn't know the other people. I never met them. We fled them a little bit because when a marvelous film would come, they would be kind enough to show it to us in their home. Um, but nobody else. But anyhow, they came, and of course, we all got to the airport hours before the plane was about to. You know how those things are, and you're very excited and very exhausted. And there were all these people, the most extraordinary thing was this class. It was like a little schoolgirl. She was so excited. And here, this woman, this tower of strength, this authority, um, was just being practically silly. <laughs> <laughs> You're not completely silly. It's just so very different from any way we've ever seen her before. Uh, anyway, I should say to myself, I think that I had ever seen her before. And I was uh, very, um, as I say, shy and backward and sort of cowering next to her. And there were all these people there that one didn't know. And you know how those things are. The plane is here. Oh, it's here. Where do you go? You go over here. No, you go over there. No, it's not here yet. Oh, it's here. <laughs> yes, it's here. You go to the observation. That's not the plane. That's another plane from Calcutta, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they were coming from there. Here and there, where finally the plane was there, and it was time to go. And what we did was we went down, and we stood outside of the customs through two glass doors, and there were lower ropes on either side so that the people could come out. And there was still, you know, all this confusion about was this the plane? Was this the plane? And then suddenly. Seeing through the glass doors. And it's so big, it's so beautiful. I remember at that moment. So everything had stopped. So the sounds turned into blurs. And this radiance just made you blind to everything else. Everything it was like people dazzling on a lens, and the other side of it would just turn into this blur of color. And it's very animated looking through the glass wall. Um, the others took care of the business. And he came out. And people greeted him and said things. And of course, I had this idea, which suited me very well. <clears throat> that you weren't to do anything, you could ask him questions. That Bob would do everything. And he came along. And embraced his friends. And the love between them was just splashing. Just. And then he started to go by me. And of course, I was just stunned. I mean, I really was just, I don't know, my mouth was literally hanging over. <laughs> 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 You know, one was not prepared, and so it was too early. There's no way of anybody telling you what that was. And he started to go by. And he stopped and came back. And he ran his hand. Out. And this is one of those things in later years, as I was telling you earlier, when I did start to think about these things and remember about me. For a long time, I don't know what was that. Especially for me, you know, gestures have a kind of meaning. And what I decided it was, which pleases me, was it was like a gesture of possession, you know, you are mine. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
The next thing that happened was total exhaustion. And I'm sure you've heard about this. I mean, one of the ways I think that I've come to uh, tell about this that usually makes it clear to people, most of many of you probably know Kitty Davy, who's a contemporary researcher. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> It was just a dying down here to charge him over the place where he was crashed. It says that when Bobby used to come to London in the early days of the series, when he'd leave, Kitty would go to bed for a week. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't go to bed, we had to go to bed for a week, but we certainly did go to bed. <clears throat> and um, the next thing that happened was Bobby was at the Delmonico seeing people and, and uh, we had uh, private interviews all for me, you know, it was, I mean, I was still undone. Not quite the way I just did undone, but undone in some way or another. And I can remember I used to do handwork in those days and I had made a blanket. Sad about that. And, uh, I don't know if this is literally true, but it's just, you know, I stood there looking at my feet, I mean, like, almost, I mean, this beauty, I just could hardly, it was dazzling at that point, literally dazzling. And it was uneventful, all I asked if I had any questions, and I was perfectly sure I had none. <laughs> and, uh, if something came up, this guy said something about my dancing, and I, she said something, you know, I was going ahead with my dancing, indicating in her way that I was doing well. He asked me about whether I was living at home for some reason, and I wasn't. And he said, don't fight with your family. He always asked, had I fought with my family? And I said, uh, no, I hadn't fought with my family. He said, don't fight with your family. It was one of the few things that he ever said directly to me. So I had had to never fight with my family, which is... It's <laughs> <laughs> many years of not fighting with my family. <laughs> Anyhow, this crash was so wonderful uh, 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 for, for me, and, and uh, uh, since she pointed out to us that even though on the following days, and even that same day, you know, one didn't have a scheduled interview with Bob, but if you stayed there at the hotel, we didn't call it hanging out in the it's what we would call hanging out now. If you stay there at the hotel, you would get to see him. Just get to see him go to the elevator or come in. And sure enough, there were times when he said, everybody who is outside waiting in the ante room, come in. Well, on one of those occasions, we came in and we were all sitting on the floor. And I was still in this bewildered state. And I would call me from the back, sitting in the back. And he caught my eyes and made this gesture of calm. And you know what it's like when you turn the gas on and have trouble lighting the match and when you light it and there's a real explosion. It's not anything that scares you. Like a boom! That happened to me at that moment. And I think that that was Bob's way of getting me out of this state that I was in. Like, why? I became animated for this person. <laughs> I climbed over everybody and sort of threw myself down his feet and he was asking me, I mean, this is nothing, this sweet, sweet, sweet voice. And he was saying, hey, was I going to the beach? Yes, was I going to come from you? Yes, I'm going to the <laughs> was, you know, he would do something lovely. So that, that was, uh, that was really the beginning there of um, what this story is about really in 56, especially is about Baba doing this to me and then which is his way and he does it for me and it's his great gift to you that he does. So this was Baba singling me out, I mean from my own degree, not realizing that as I say, you know, these things take hold of you deep down inside of your unconscious and you don't care you go just Gets a hold of every little thing. So this was the first thing that happened um, to, on the build-up. This is the build-up side of the story. Mm -hmm. Then the next thing that happened was we arrived at the center in Little Beach, and there was not at that time accommodation for all of the people that were part of this party to stay on the center. And I guess I had been relatively late in making my mind up to be there. So I was somebody who 
was not staying on the center. There were about six or seven people that spilled the room. And uh, on the very first morning, Bob called all those people into the lagoon cabin. And he did this invariably with the ball. I shouldn't say invariably. Bob did this with people. He would ask, did you sleep well? And then you have a good breakfast. How are you feeling? Take care of your health. You know, to be strong and healthy. And, uh, um, and he went down this road, people, and, and there were complaints. You know, there was especially one woman, you know, very dramatic, but you may know her. I mean, it's not a real complaint, I shouldn't. Hear, but there was an Israeli woman, uh, Carrie Benchon, who was there. And she, for some reason, was not staying on the scene. Oh, wow. To be this close but so far away. <laughs> There's all this stuff going on, and, and um, Bunty, who some of you know, was also somebody who was not immediately at the center. This is a very bothering thing, so far. Called, I had slept like a lot of And Bob called Kitty and Elizabeth, of course, you know. They had done all this, and the center was magnificent. Those of you that know it know what an extraordinary course it is. And I always said to them, you know, these people are coming to me and they want to stay in. You know, can't you do more? And I was the other. You've already done everything. Can't you do more? <laughs> so um, spots were found for various people to sleep in there. Where was I going to sleep? And um, Somebody remembered, I don't know if it was Kitty or, or who it was, but somebody remembered that there was underneath the barn a little storage room. I don't know, it's at the beach end of the barn, and it's now, it's just at the center a little while ago, and it's now about a patch of time. It's a tiny little room, just big enough for them to put an arm gun or all those canvas numbers that go immediately to the middle. <laughs> And it was, you know, stormed all night. I didn't get sleep to sleep. But I did see that, and I felt, again, you know, without quite realizing it, I felt pretty good about that. So I was getting to sleep under the barn. And eventually, in fact, somebody left. This was one, one of those funny things that happened back around the world. I remember Jane, I remember, in 56 or 58, or Andy, or whatever. But I think people were to obey Baba. If you were staying there, you had to take some commitment to obey Baba. And somebody had brought a boyfriend, you know, who thought maybe, you know. And in the end, when he was confronted with the situation, he realized he could not stay there. He left. So I did get to stay then in the front cabin with Don Stevens and things like that. After a couple two under the bar. <laughs> The next thing that happened as part of the build-up was a friend of mine flew from Nassau just to meet Bob. And this was a guy who I, in a certain way, kind of idolized. I thought he was great. And he, uh, this I didn't find out until many years later, he had been to Miss Crest to talk about, we used to talk about Bob, this guy. Was. And he had been to Miss Crest about Bob, and she had said that he needed to find somebody else to bring him to Bob. It was not fair, and it had to do with the fact that he was interested, I think, in the occult in some way that she felt was not for her to, to help with. Anyhow, again, so wise, Miss Crest. I was very excited that this guy was appearing. And she said, you must introduce him to Bob. And uh, this was several days after the started. Well, it was uh, after lunch, and we were waiting down there by the boathouse. And in those days, as some of you may know, we didn't cross that bridge at all. You never went across that bridge. You stayed on the, on the kitchen side of the center. And we were waiting for him to come across. And he would always stop on the bridge and say how beautiful it was and how it pleased him so much. Just looking absolutely wonderful and full of life and love. And he came over and again he said, Did you have a good lunch? You know, did you have a nap? Did there have enough food? You know, all these things. And um, at the appropriate moment, but I felt I just said, Baba, this is my friend, so and so, who has come here from NASA to meet you. Baba looked at this guy, and he embraced me. <laughs> and he went away. <laughs> and he, you know, he went up the stairs and he said, So again, I was. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this was the final thing was 
was one day, one, after, one morning at the barn, Bubba called me to give me a job to do. And, and I was just staying at the barn during my time. Bubba said to me, every, he was leaving and Monday was leaving and everybody was going to have lunch and that, but I was just stay there in case anybody came to look for him. I was to have this message and I was to tell, tell him that Bubba would be back as soon as I should have so I just stayed there, and of course, nobody came. You know, I was looking everywhere to do my job. Finally, one person came, you know, so I ran after him, and I told him to jump. And he went away, and, and the afternoon wore on, and it got to be two o'clock, and then Bala came back in my car. And he stood there, he put his hands on my shoulder, stood there. And he said, Bala is a priest. This is my good man, like this. Um, you know, Everybody went away and had food and rested. And you, Baba, asked you to stay here and you stood here. You know, and Baba's happy. So again, although I, I even remember in some part of me thinking, you know, well, this is not a big deal. You know, one wants to be asked to give one's life up or something, you know, not just miss lunch. <laughs> As I say, inside, you know, this thing is growing. Well, next came the boom. We um, went with, to the beach with Baba, and the idea was to find things for him to take back to Mera, shells and driftwood. And although it was an overcast day, I can remember this so vividly. Baba had a blue coat He sat down on the beach and he made a little sort of um, April came out of the saga and, and people went and found things and, and uh, I was determined to find a sand on You know, the place was completely, there was no condominiums, no hilting, no nothing. It was just you know, completely uh, wild and you, you found sand on well, It took me a while, but I was determined oh, I was going to find a sand on And I did. And I walked up to Bob just as a please as a finish. And I gave him the sand on and he looked at him and he looked at this thing through. <laughs> well, I shook. I literally shook. It upset me so. You know, I said, but it's me, Bob. I did. <laughs> The next thing that happened was that Baba called us, those of us that were going on to California, there was Tex and Bundy, you know. And we were there, the woman that I mentioned earlier, she was the first person that the tour of us. Naomi Westerfeld was also at the center in Philadelphia. But each of the other three were going to appear in two numbers, and I was only going to appear in one. <laughs> and, um, Without being terribly conscious of it, this worried me enormously. How was Baba going? How was Baba going to know that I was this great dancer? You know, if they were going to do things. I mean, not one thought about pleasing Baba, you know, or, or amusing him, or, or anything like that. Well. With that on my mind, and this the shell experience, I guess Baba needed to um, give me another little boost up. Uh, so the next thing that happened was, uh, this is a story that I'm sure you've heard from text, many of you. This strange thing happened at the Garden Ball in LA, where, for some reason, I'll make this quick because I see I'm really going, oh, no, 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 no. Um, there were no places for text in the tent, or for me. And it was a formal dinner, you know, there were place cards, there was a, a head table with Bob and Mandolin and a long table, or a couple of long tables, maybe even three. And, and there was a, a hostess, and one of the people that had made the arrangements came and got you from the hallway and took you in and, and uh, sat you at your place. And um, the door kept opening and closing, and this woman kept coming out and not inviting us in. <laughs> and finally, Baba, who we could see when it was a swinging door, I mean, and we could see him through the door, and he was gesturing to us. And we didn't know what was going on, and he, you know, called us in, and he said, what, and what is this? And it was a very uncomfortable and unpleasant moment, and um, 
I had texted, you know, there are no places for us, but I'm like, and Bob had perished and how to get up, and he sees us, and I was like, wow. Um, and, um, yeah. <laughs> And uh, it was not a good, it was not a good scene, as we say now. Um, and Baba left very soon afterwards. And um, but that again, you know, that that helped the old ego. <laughs> and let's see where am I here? And the next thing that happened, then we had another up and a down, all in one. <laughs> was that, um, this is, we had gone up to San Francisco, and somebody had given Baba some Swedish wedding cakes, I think they were called, just little balls of butter and sugar, and a little bit of flour in there, and powdered sugar. And there's a picture of Beryl Williams somewhere, where Baba had taken some sugar and put on her nose. You know, Beryl was one of Baba's first black disciples. <laughs> just, just a gorgeous woman. She died very early on. And um, she was playing that game that you've seen him play in films. But she did with the greatest delight and the greatest skill. You know, the little chicken throw right over here. And she couldn't quite throw these because they were so fragile. And we were very close in. And at a certain point, you know, if you were like this, you just put one right in my hand. And I had this it was a conscious thought. No games if you're wrong. <laughs> so I ate this thing, and the next thing I knew, he was, Please just punch. he was playing the game, and he fainted, and he gave it to me, and I dropped it on the floor. <laughs> it burst into a million tiny little crumbs. And you know, if the master gives you something, you must eat it. So I'm scraping up the dirt and everything. <laughs> Sort of, you know, you commiserate with you at the same time that he, he just enjoyed everything so much. He was just bursting with joy. <laughs> Almost always. Anyhow, very soon after that, we did do this famous performance um, in the Holiday Lodge there. And uh, I was, you know, I was entirely preoccupied with this fact that I was not going to shine, you know. And when we were finished, Baba made some kind of a gesture that, because I was so preoccupied with this, I was convinced he was saying, and don't you have anything else to do? You know? Which someone has since suggested that maybe he was saying that. I don't know. Anyhow, what happened at that point, let me tell you, was an ego explosion. I jumped up. I started apologizing and saying that I had no dance plan, but I could do all these steps, and I started just shutting off. <laughs> There's something in, in, in the classical ballet uh, lingo that you call two to force, it means a show of strength. These tricks that you do that are very brilliant. And I was, you know, um, reasonably gifted, they were very gifted, and I had a great teacher. And I started doing all these things, and Baba was sweet, and, and uh, uh, entertained all this, in other words, he allowed me to do this, and, and tech saved my life, I started to applaud. <laughs> so anyhow, Baba did let us get this stuff out of our system. <laughs> But anyhow, from this I want to jump immediately to 1958, when, believe it, we were prepared to dance. I mean, we didn't ask Baba to let us dance, but we, and I was certainly one of the movers in this, decided that just in case he asked us to dance, we would be prepared. And we really did prepare a big, big program um, with costumes and music, and, and it was very um, rich in the event we did do in the bar, Baba we did. Of course, know that, that this was going on and had discussed events. We did dance at the barn. And we can also be sure that I had two things to do. <laughs> One of them uh, was a duet that I danced with by the barber, choreographed by Paul Taylor for the occasion. And the other was the staging of a ballet by Sir Frederick Bastion called the Pantanella Skaters. Bunty Kelly, who knew the ballet from having done it in the Royal Ballet, arranged for a small group of people. 
And yes, you had the lead. <laughs> <laughs> It's a, a series of divergence kind about of skaters that are sort of held together by this one figure who's a show off. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> and he comes out and does all these tricks. <laughs> well, um, the, the part of this story that's a little more serious is that, again, I was completely occupied with myself. And although it was a wonderful occasion by all accounts, Baba was delighted, everybody there said it was wonderful, I felt nothing. I felt no, um, um, what's the word? I wasn't uplifted by this in any way. Uh, I believe everybody that I danced very, very well, but I didn't enjoy it myself in a way that one can enjoy it. It wasn't exhilarating in any way, that's the word I was with. And to sort of wind up this whole thing, and again, this is something that I didn't realize for years and years and years after the event, this is one of those bottle coincidences that is very serious. Um, years later, when I was in American Ballet Theater, I had an injury, I sustained an injury on the stage that really was the beginning, although I danced on for many, many years after that. It was the beginning of the end of what I was talking about that day when I said to Miss Cranston, I'm prepared to give up everything but my dancing. It was the beginning of the end of that. And the ballet I was doing that night was the event to me. <clears throat> but believe, can you imagine I didn't make that connection for 10 years or 15 years after it happened? So that was dancing for Bob. And um, I thought maybe I'd tell one little story about 62 and then something that happened in 1980. Maybe we can talk a little bit. But um, in 1962, um, at the East West Gathering, as Jane was talking about last night, oh no, it was in the, the Pacific Pursuit game. There was this great rainstorm, and that's what I thought I'd just tell you about it, the way that looked to me, because it was quite an amazing experience for me. But anyhow, in 62, um, what Baba had told us would happen, had happened. In 1956, he told us one day there will be so many people that you will not be able to be close to me the way you are now. And of course, as you know, there were thousands and thousands and thousands of people there. And Baba was wonderful to the Westerners. He saw us in the mornings inside Guru Sun in the hall there. And some interesting things happened that we can talk about other times during the week, but uh, it was uh, uh, in many ways a much more formal situation than it had been in the 50s as well. And um, I believe it was the very first day that we, the Westerners got to see Bob before, I guess, one day previous to the official opening of the Sahara of the uh, East. Of the East. And uh, that afternoon we came to the uh, Pandal, and there were these thousands of people there. And you remember, Baba hadn't been seen people, he was ill. And it was clear he was ill, although he was still radiant and, and beautiful. Somehow his majesty was much more apparent. Having to do with his age, I guess, and the slowness, <clears throat> but radiant, radiant and beautiful. And um, he was these thousands of people each waiting for their turn to do the Indian custom of Ram Dhamma. And there was this unrest, you could feel it, you could not hear it. And then the sky started to get dark, it seemed to me, and the pandal started to flatten and it started to rain. And it was just these people started to face their so longing, they came on moaning, and they, they broke through the ranks and they started to rush the platform. And Baba was there, and it was raining, and the pandal was flapping, and it was as if Baba, with all this love, was almost expanding with it. And it's as if you saw the cycle of his love going out and their love coming in. And it, it's just as if he was in ecstasy and got enormous and big with all nature, carrying on like this. And just for a moment, it was just not, I, this is the avatar, this is the avatar, and this is the center of everything. And then it seemed the whole thing started to diminish and fade down. 
And um, the feeling after it is as if you've gone through a fever. You know how you feel when the fever is broken? That's the way it felt to me. And text, I got text, this is why we came. <laughs> It was amazing. It was just this amazing, amazing thing. <laughs> then in 1980, um, when Bobby dropped his body, it was a terrible shock to me. As I, I mentioned, I guess, I didn't take the whole thing completely for granted. You know, there was Bobby in front of us, and it was great. <clears throat> And um, in a very, um, again, non-thinking way, so again, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't looked into this. I hadn't looked into these events. Um, I thought it's over. Um, I mean, I do remember Don Mollis the one who uh, told me about the uh, driving body. <laughs> And I can remember we lived in the same building in those days. <laughs> and I can remember going down in the street and being shocked that the cars were still going. You know, it seemed impossible that things would continue. But I went on my way, I was going along. <clears throat> and it was many, many, many years before I went back to the center. I didn't visit the center between 1958 and sometime in the 70s, I think, 1976. When Donald, who, by the way, I should mention, was at Williamsburg, Virginia, the first of summer. Yeah. Although we didn't become friends right away, he was certainly there. And I'm already a student in this crisis. But, um, I wasn't, I, I hadn't gone away from Bob inside of myself at all, but as I say, I thought it is over. It me, Baba. In 1969, I said, no point to go to India. Baba wouldn't be here. I meant Baba. Uh, Baba would do this to me. Mm. But Donald, not physically, but he shook me. And he said, come to this center. And I did go with him. In a rage that Baba wasn't there. Hating the fact that there were all these people eating dirty dishes in the sink in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Slowly that all changed, and, and um, over time I began to, to see that it wasn't over, in fact. And as Paul said, I guess to, to the hundred you know, this is just the beginning, in many ways. So finally, I guess Donald is the first one from among the dancers who went back to India, and then Tex went. And they came back with very different um, stories to tell. But I got the urge to go, so I went in 1980, in the summer of 1980. But still very uptight in a way. Um, struggling with a little bit with this thing that came up last night when we were talking. I didn't want Baba to be underneath that stone, and that was all there was to it. Um, I would go into the tomb and I would kneel down and say, oh, this is the tomb. Blah, blah, blah. You know, I'd sit down and, and, I mean, I was really kind of coming on that way. Well, many, many things happened, but the point I want to make here, the story, the lovely story from the beginning, is that, as you know, Mayra and the other women come over to decorate the tomb once a month. And although I was only there for two years, that Sunday, or whichever day it is, I guess it's a Sunday, fell on the one weekend I was there. And I got the window right away and I said, What happens on these days? Uh, and they told me that Mary goes in and everybody goes in one by one and bows down. Here it is, you know, you're going to turn into a puddle in front of all these people. You know, just become a weeping, slobbering idiot. <laughs> So this thing started, as you can see, look at that. This thing started, and I thought, how am I going to do this? You know, how am I going to get this out of this? And I remember my final moment with Baba at Guru Prasad in 1969. 
He was saying to him, well, this again, for me, was terrible. Bob had often said we'd not see him again, but if he, you know, his glorification, his humiliation and glorification was going to happen next week, you know, it never happened. And one stopped paying attention to it, if you were me, after a while, and understood that you didn't understand, you know. And, but this was very different. Bob was as solemn as he ever was. I wouldn't say he was ever very, very solemn. But this was serious, you know, he said we would not see him again in the body. And as I say, he was clearly much altered since 1958. And, uh, beautiful, you know, but nobody lives forever. And we were all on the line in Bill Prasad waiting to have a final embrace with Bob and say farewell. And it came to be my turn, and I didn't want to do it. It's like I dug my heels in. And Ted, who was behind me, started pushing me forward, and I was holding up the line. He started to be like, it's a little Bob. And Bob looked at me and he had a lot and he said, be happy. He was like, get out of here with this stuff. <laughs> well, I remember this just before I went into the tomb and I marched in because I had no practice. So when I knelt down, I banged my head up. All the lights in the world went on. And I kind of backed out of there with this grin on my face. <laughs> and I went around to Mansari and I told her what had happened. Mansari said, Break the coconut. <laughs> So that's all I thought of, of, that's all I've kind of prepared to, to say. I'm happy to have talked to people. How did you feel when you were thinking that you were trying to dance? I was hoping I was going to dance well. <laughs> and um, the other thing is, you know, it was a tricky job. Um, you may have heard text talk about this. Dr. Kenmore had designed a chair to be sure that Baba wouldn't fall out. And it had, it was like a sedan chair, there were two poles. And when you carried the poles a certain way, it made Baba do like this, but he, he was to go backwards. Harry said he was to go backwards. Well, Baba didn't want to go backwards, he wanted to go forwards. So it was as if he, if we weren't careful, he would fall out. You see? So it was a trick to do, and I took it, um, well, there are a couple of things to be completely honest about this. Um, there was a feeling, to be honest, is that a wise thing to do? <laughs> there was a feeling that we were very lucky to get this job, and that we should hang on to it, because if we didn't, we'd lose it. And I didn't like that. That made me uncomfortable. This is a prudish way. <laughs> this wasn't being very nice. <laughs> so that was kind of tricky, and also all this thumping on the back was also tricky. It was unnerving. You know. um, and what's very interesting about a lot of this is now I see the films, and I see um, how much I enjoyed it. <laughs> you know? But the, 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 main, the main answer to your question is that I was very preoccupied with dancing. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I could identify with what with when I in the last part you were talking about. In India, drop the body. Yes. And, and when you, like I've been through a little bit of that myself, but you know, when you came back, and, you know, and when you went to India. I feel like a lot of back now with me, you know, kind of feeling. No, but I, I'm just relating to myself. Oh, uh -huh. You understand? Mm -hmm. uh, having gone a period of time where I thought I'd gone as high as I could. Mm -hmm. just sort of, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. A lot of people go have some yeah. similar type of thing. I didn't feel it was high or low or anything like that. But, you know, um, in some funny way, when Baba was in the body, Although it was completely realistic, unrealistic, completely unrealistic, one did think that maybe he would call you in India, you know. 
And generally, one felt, I mean, there were these orders, don't write, you know, or do do the silence days, or fast, or there was even a celibacy time, and it was a time of repeating a certain phrase that he gave us. And in some funny way, you felt that you were part of his life in some funny way. I mean, I even did receive, you know, an air letter in my own little postal box once in a while. And then, of course, that was over. Um, well, we got the body, but then, of course, now it's up to us. I mean, now it's for us to have the whole part of our lives. Yeah. After you were injured dancing, that period of time where I guess you stopped dancing. I didn't. Um, yeah. But did you feel like Bob was trying to take dancing from you, or you yeah. needed to give it up, or was that a natural? Um, I didn't think about that until 15 years after after the fact. When it first happened, I didn't stop at all. I mean, um, I mean, the, the the details of the story are simply that um, it was in performance. I shouldn't have finished the ballet. I should have gone and lay down and got my foot in the cast. Instead, I finished the ballet. When I went to the hospital, uh, it was a very small town in upstate New York, in New York. Um, the nurse who was on night duty said it's probably just a sprain, you know, and it's nobody here to take an x-ray. I have to call somebody out, which is all that I wanted to hear, of course. So it was, you know, not treated correctly, and because uh, it was fractured, in fact, the fifth of the tarsal was broken. And um, well, slowly, over a period of time, a condition got built up on me. It's a boring story, but slowly, slowly, slowly this happened. I couldn't have missed it again as Bob was crazy. It would have killed me if I had to stop. I mean, I was that involved or that identified. Is that the answer to your question? Yeah. Were you in the different times? No. No. Well, he treated us as Westerners, and um, very beautifully as Westerners. He would mention every once in a while. Um, I guess in India there's a, a tradition with the twins right here, where you, the man, you don't show the soles of your feet to the man. Well, that was when you were allowed to sit in chairs and cross our legs. And, you know, he, um, I think this is part of Baba's uh, work where he, he says that it is it, it and life are the same. It, you know, and that you must live your life. It's not that you should go into some room and hold your breath, you know, and look at the sun or anything like that. Uh, it's life. That's everywhere is the opportunity to, to love God. That beautiful thing that Eris says, you know, uh, somebody spoke of turning away from God. Well, where do you turn? And, you know, how do you do that? There is no way to do it. <clears throat> yeah. Did you ever do any orders other than the Fox and the Fox and the Were you able to go through those? Was there any order that you felt singled you out and made you feel special in your circumstances? The one that would want to stay at the barn would be the one. But other than that, the answer is really no. There was one time in the 50s when we wanted to repeat a phrase a certain number of times every day for a month, I think it was, and different people, I am guessing according to their strengths. I mean, some people were asked to do it thousands of times every day. You know, and I was asked to do it 500 times a day. And again, believe it or not, I did it in the most cursory way. You know, I mean, I sort of got through it. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, you said that when you didn't want to go back to the center because Bob wasn't going to actually be there. That when I dropped by, did you feel that in your life? Did you, did you feel that he wasn't with you? No, well, again, I didn't. As I, I, I said, you know. I, I didn't analyze things very much for many, 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 many years. You know, not until the late, late 70s did I start trying to interpret anything for myself. But it is true that my career, which clearly, I'm sure you gathered from what I've said, has got very closely 
to do with my life with God, you know, the dancing has been my way with God, was in a really peculiar situation at that time. And um, in the mid-60s, 1965 to be exact, um, I went back to Marsh Dance. And by 1968, 69, I was in trouble with that. Although again, you know, I, I did, in terms of the world, very well. I was in this kind of tour all over the world. And, you know, he's considered one of the great geniuses of the, of the avant-garde and all that business. Um, I was in big trouble. You know. And, um, you know, in terms of surrendering the world, I wasn't in it. I wasn't doing it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Do you know anything about the man Bob and Hans and Margaret Crasson? I know that she said that he was a great pupil. <laughs> <laughs> and, and dancing is principally rhythm, you know. And uh, what she said was that he took it immediately. You know, I mean, there was no, he didn't have to filter it through any sort of mental, he wasn't inhibited. He wasn't in the opinion. Yeah. During your career, do you feel you were dancing for Bob as a member of his groups? On one level, the answer is very easily no. You know, on another level, I mean, you know, I didn't, as I said last night, you know, I'm not one for saying prayers and giving things to, to Baba um, in a special way. My understanding was that it was, it, it, it wasn't even all Baba, the dancing is Baba, the house Baba, the stage is Baba, the curtain is Baba, the gels on the lights are Baba, it's all Baba, and you do your best. I was, I was, you know, it's a given for performers. You have to, I think it's an ingredient that you are self-centered. And I was a pretty good performer. <laughs> you know, I really was, I mean, I felt it was part of my job was taking care of myself, you know, and, and uh, especially in classical work, there's a certain, element, uh, this word is such a, again, these are loaded words, you know, so you're like a medium, you know, I mean, something comes through you, and I was good at that, you know, and, and uh, I would go around saying, bobble, 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 but uh, I'm inclined, I'm not sure I understand what you're asking me exactly, but I'm inclined to say no, you know, it, it wasn't devotional in any way, yeah. Well, you said, Peter, that when you perform, you should feel, I am the best. I am the very best. Bob has given that as a guideline. Yeah. Well, interestingly enough, though, with all that I've said about this monumental ego, I didn't feel that. You know. and, uh, did you say that? <laughs> Don't go on forever. You know, it's something you do genuinely when you're young. 
Well, some people do go on and on. I always felt that if I hadn't had any centuries, I, I would have been one that would have gone on. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when I was coming to the end of that, I had, in 1965, I had started to teach for the first time. Um, and I was hurting, I guess. It's, it's, it's not that something wonderful happened, it's that things got pretty terrible, I guess. And, is that an answer? I, mean, I can't think of a specific event, I have to tell you. But I was pretty lost. I was pretty lost, especially in terms of my career. In terms of my and, and did the introduction make your life richer? Oh, yes. Measurably so. Did anyone ever come to Baba for you? Yes. <laughs> Not, not very many people, <laughs> but a few. Maybe you say it through me, you know. I mean, Bob does it all, as you know. Yeah. But um, I was the one. I was the one. <laughs> I first told Donald Mahler about Bob. And the context was, you know, you're such a horrible person, why don't you try and do something? <laughs> Texas text is of a slightly previous generation. He's a little bit older than Donald. So Donald and I were really students together with Miss Cranks, you know, in class and, and super in the office together. We lived in the same apartment building and uh, mixed it up. Um, and a couple of other people. <laughs> How did being in Bhagavad affect your relationships with non Bhagavad? <clears throat> Well, I can tell you, in 1955, I was in a Broadway musical, and I told my partner, you know, that the next day I wasn't going to talk, the next day was going to be July 10th. And she said, why? And I said, because of my guru. And she said, you're what? <laughs> uh -uh. You know, people didn't know. Um, <laughs> A little, uh, you know, there, there are many ways to talk about this. I guess a little bit. I mean, Baba. At times, allows you to be with anyone, which is a wonderful thing. It's this thing that Jane was talking about last night. You don't look at their outside. Somehow, you're able to get get in touch with something else. And sometimes, you know, that happens. My situation now is very, very different. <laughs> I'm in one of the great bastions of intellectuality, which is Cornell University. And um, my colleagues, associates, friends see Bob's picture and they hear about him, hear about him. To a great extent, it makes them very uncomfortable. And um, it confuses them because up until that point, they were inclined to feel warmly towards me. I'm getting cut off side here. 